order on? Thank you. Well, I'm going to take my jacket off, but amongst some of the wonderful gifts I've had this Christmas, somebody brought me another Christmas tie. And as you know, during Advent, every Sunday I've worn a, a Christmas tie. And so I thought, well, I better put it on today because it's the last chance I'll get to wear it till next year. So there we are. Okay, that's the Christmas tie uh, for this Sunday. So I don't know. Okay. Praise the Lord. Over the past weeks in our own congregation here in Leyland, we've been considering a special study of God's word in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And therefore, I'd like you to turn with me again today uh, for the last time this year uh, to Isaiah chapter 9, and we'll read verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word. Lord, we thank you that it's so full of the richness for our lives so full of truth, so full of uh, a wondrous uh, story of Jesus. Father, we pray this morning you'll bless your word to our hearts. Lord, we realize on days like today, it's easy to get distracted. But Father, I pray on this Sunday morning, as we're in your presence, Lord, we will give you the time and attention that, Lord, we would listen to your voice and listen to your word, that, Lord, you might speak into all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. The prophet Isaiah, through ministering hundreds of years before the first advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, he provides us with some of the most vivid, descriptive names that were given to the promised Messiah. He is seen through the prophetical lens um, in various manners by Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, he's called Emmanuel. In Isaiah 43, verse 3, he's called thy saviour. He's uh, in Isaiah 53. He's called the man of sorrows. In Isaiah 59 and verse 20, he's called the Redeemer. And these were just some of the titles of the Lord Jesus from the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 gives us that beautiful cluster of names that we've been looking at during this Advent season about the incarnate Son of God. He is called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And over the last few weeks, we've been considering those names one by one in our morning teaching of the Word of God on a Sunday. And today we come to the final one of those lovely glittering gems. Professor Young, who wrote a wonderful commentary on Isaiah, puts it in the following manner. He said, how climatic and emphatic is this name? Because you see, friends, 
This is the culmination of all that has gone before. The promised Messiah, when he would come, this last fifth title tells us that he will be the Prince of Peace. Peace in the days of Isaiah were a scarce commodity. Little Judah was surrounded by all her enemies on all sides, and God had used the chastening of her by the Assyrians to chasten Israel for their sin. But the nation did not repent, though God delivered them. In the days of Hezekiah, the nation did not repent. They did not turn and seek the face of God as they ought to have done. And so Isaiah warned of pending judgment. And he called the nation to repent, but apostasy had taken such a hold on the religious life of the nation that each day they were heading irretrievably to further judgment and to Babylonian captivity. Sin had weakened the nation and they were an easy prey. And we see, just as we see in our Western world today, uh, as we look at the nations, sin has weakened them so much that they become easy prey to the enemy within and to the enemy of truth without. The Prince of Peace came into a world that was at war with itself. But more than that, he came into a world that was at war with Almighty God. And today, we live in a world with in such a similar situation. All this, uh, in this little planet of ours, when you think how tiny it is, and yet there are over 40 areas of ongoing conflict costing thousands of lives every year and many of those areas of conflict the western nations have preferred to forget about them and you never hear about them but every day human lives are being taken and souls are being ushered into god's eternity and as we think even globally it's only the threat of mutual nuclear annihilation that, humanly speaking, prevents another world war occurring. The Prince of Peace is needed today more than ever. Just as in the days of Isaiah 9 and verse 6, just as in our own day in 2021, mankind needs the Prince of Peace more than ever. Now today we're going to consider the teaching from the Word of God concerning Christ as the Prince of Peace. And I pray this morning that the Spirit of God will teach us all something more about the Lord Jesus. I pray this morning that he'll draw our hearts closer to him even as we spend time around this truth of God's word. So first of all this morning, let's remember the revelation of the prince, the revelation of the prince. It was the Holy Spirit who gave these names to Isaiah that the Messiah would be known by. When he looked down the corridor of time, and he prophesied of the one who was to come, the Prince of Peace. It was all part of what biblical commentators call Isaiah's uh, Emmanuel trilogy. Because Isaiah presents a threefold presentation of the coming Messiah, the Prince of Peace. He foretold of the day when God will be manifest in the flesh, the greatest miracle of all ages, when God would step out of eternity and 
into the confines of time in the second person of the Godhead. When Emmanuel will be born into the world, walking amongst men, dwelling amongst men, and how as a young man of about 33 years of age, he would die on a cruel Roman cross to uh, die for sin and to redeem men and women from a last eternity. And Isaiah, in the first part of his amazing trilogy about the Lord Jesus, is calls him in Isaiah 7.14, Emmanuel, God with us. That little child will be conceived virginally in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Friends, we never cease to marvel at the virginal conception of the Lord Jesus. And yet there was no other way for the incarnation to take place. The Savior needed to be flesh and blood like ourselves, yet without sin. And yet at the same time, he needed to be God in human flesh. And there was no other way for the God-man to enter into time and dwell amongst men other than by the virginal conception. It's one of the great foundational doctrines of the Christian faith, the word made flesh and dwelling amongst men. The second part of Isaiah's vision of the coming Messiah is found in this wonderful unfolding of the Messiah of who he would be in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, the names we've read. And we read in the opening part of Isaiah 9 of the darkness that covered the land. And the only light that shone into the darkness of the land was the coming, was the promise of the coming Messiah. And that light arose across the land. So in Isaiah's day, it was sure, it was certain, because a child would be born, a son would be given, humanity and deity coming together. And that's very important, God manifest in the flesh. The incarnation, if you like, was the enfleshment of the Son of God. And here in this text, Isaiah was given further prophetical insight into whom he would be. He will be wonderful. And we've considered that, haven't we, in the weeks gone by, the wonderful Savior. Oh, friends, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, this morning. All of the people of God we can say that from the depths of our hearts today. And yet, he's our counsellor. And we thank God for the scriptures of truth that provide us counsel in our journey to eternity. And Christ, through his word, counsels his people. And by his spirit, he guides and directs our footsteps. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father, as we were dealing with last week. And it culminates in this final title, the Prince of Peace. Friends, this morning, we are before the royal son of God. We're in the midst of royalty. It doesn't matter whether we're in the building here or whether you're at home on Zoom this morning. We are bowing before the royal son of God, the Prince of of peace. But the third part of uh, Isaiah's trilogy uh, in Isaiah uh, is the vision of the suffering Messiah. And you have that in Isaiah 52 and 53. He was the servant who would vicariously suffer, wasn't he, uh, in the guilty room and stead of sinners. The Bible tells us he was wounded for our transgressions. You know, we've often been wounded because of our own sin. But Christ was wounded because of our sin. And the Bible says the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. 
This is the revelation of who the Prince of Peace was going to be. Charles Wesley put it in a verse that is such a favorite in that carol we sing, Heart the Herald Angels Sing. And one of the verses says this, Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings, mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth, heart the herald, angels sing glory to the newborn king. So friends, he is the prince of peace. This is royalty. And friends, this is how I've tried to illustrate to you that he's revealed in the word of God, particularly in Isaiah. But secondly, consider with me, not only the revelation of the prince of peace, but consider with me the realization of this peace. Because the word that is used in Isaiah 9 verse 6 for peace is that well-known Hebrew word shalom, meaning peace. David Gusick was in his commentary, he actually tells us that the Hebrew word shalom is more than the cessation of hostility, but it's God's word for wholeness, for goodness, and total satisfaction in life. Isn't that a wonderful description of what the peace of God really is? Jesus spoke something about that wholeness and that goodness and that satisfaction. In John's Gospel 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That's the total satisfaction of what Jesus is talking about. Shalom, you see. It's a precious gift of God that will outlast time itself. The goodness that we're going to enjoy, friends, is the goodness that will stretch beyond time and it will endure into eternity. This is the ultimate summarization of God's blessing upon an individual life. He is the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. You see, friends, it wasn't it mirrored. Remember when Aaron gave that blessing in number 624, the words of the priest to pronounce upon the people? He said, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. You see, it's the peace of God that expresses the goodness and the totality of goodness to us. But that peace was purchased at highest price. We referred to Isaiah chapter 53. Let me read to you verse 5 of that chapter because it gives you some understanding. Let's just read what it says in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse to it but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed that middle phrase needs a little bit of explanation the chastisement of our peace was upon him what is meant well that, in reality, is the punishment of our sin being inflicted upon Christ. You see, that was an act of God's implacable justice. Justice had to be satisfied. And in wrath, God took vengeance, not on us and on our sins, 
but took vengeance and outpoured his wrath upon the person of his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to be our surety, the one who came to be our substitute, the one who is the only savior of sinners. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Oh, friends, all we should have suffered by way of that chastisement, and yet it was poured out upon the Son of God. As has been pointed out, the cessation in warfare in itself does not bring about the condition of peace. There are many nations that have learned this in history. You'll find that. They've won the war, but they couldn't win the peace. The cause of war, you see, has to be removed. But the peace also has to be ensured. The cause of war, spiritually speaking, is God's war against sin. The wrath of God burns eternally against sin. And in order for men to be at peace with God, God had to be at peace with men. The enmity between God and man, it had to be removed. That enmity that God spoke of in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the man. And how did the Prince of Peace achieve this at his first advent? Well, he came as the Prince of Peace. And how did he remove that enmity between God and man? Well, Colossians 2 tells us, and verse 14, you, uh, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. Friends, all of the ordinances of the law of God, all of the condemnation that was included in the law of God, Christ took it. And he nailed it to the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. In his own person, he took the condemnation of God's law. It wasn't nailed upon us, but it was nailed upon him, our substitute. The chastisement, you see, was not laid upon us. It was laid upon the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. This was how divine wrath was appeased. This is how divine justice was satisfied. This is how eternal peace was purchased. Colossians 1 verse 20, and, he, uh, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. You know, friends, we have peace in this dark world of sin this morning because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me emphasize those who are on Zoom this morning or those who may catch this message up on our church website on the YouTube channel when it's uploaded, that the only way for you to know peace with God is to realize that it was purchased for you by the shed blood of Christ on Calvary's cross. You know, all, all your striving, all your praying, all your working can ever purchase such peace. But this peace was purchased by the Prince of Peace himself. When he came amongst men, when he dwelt amongst us, when he died for us on the cross of Calvary. Oh, friends, this peace is pursued by God. And you know, friends, this is a wonderful biblical truth, I'm going to say. Because when the Savior was born in Bethlehem of Judea, and the angelic host surrounded the shepherds, and they surrounded them, and they said, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. 
Christ was sent into this world to pursue peace and goodwill between God and men. This is the teaching of the Bible. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 18 and 19. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. There Paul was speaking about the ministry he had been given by the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, oftentimes, emphasis is put on by the ecumenical church on reconciliation between men and men. But the reconciliation that the Apostle Paul spoke about was not between men and men, but between God and men through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not until men are reconciled to God that they can really truly be reconciled to one another. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. Uh, let me just turn to that with you. 2 Corinthians 15. Oh, I'm sorry, it stops at 13, doesn't it? I've got the wrong scripture down. It might be 2 Corinthians 5. Well, anyway, praise the Lord. I had another scripture for you there. Oh, yes, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You know, folks, all over the world this morning, God's got ambassadors. Speaking, whether they're doing it on the internet or whether they're doing it in a park around a tree or in some remote village with people sat around them on the ground. But, you know, all over the world this morning, there are people pleading with people, be ye reconciled to God. Why? Because he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God, by his spirit, is pursuing peace with his people today, with men and women all over the world, different ones. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 36, Peter was preaching to the household of Cornelius. And he said in verse 36 of that chapter, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Friends, he pursues you at heart this morning. God is pursuing souls because Christ is the Prince of Peace. Jesus himself said in John chapter 14 and verse 27, he said these words, he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace I leave with you, he said. My peace I give unto you. Three times over, we read about this. And Think of Romans 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, that tells us this, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So we've had the revelation of the Prince of Peace. We've had the realization 
of his peace. And finally, the reign of the Prince of Peace. Because our scripture in Isaiah, speaking of this Prince of Peace, in chapter 9, says this in verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of his father David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Friends, Christ has a, a perpetual reign. His kingdom shall be no end. Thank God this morning he shall reign forever and ever. There's going to be no end to the reign of the Prince of Peace. Earthly empires, earthly kingdoms rise and fall. Presidents come and go. Prime ministers come and go. And uh, they have fixed terms of office. Elections can put them out very suddenly. But concerning the kingdom of Christ, there is no end. Thank God this morning we're not talking about a, a temporal kingdom but one that's going to last for all of God's eternity. In John chapter 18 and verse 36, the disciples expected Jesus to put up an earthly kingdom to establish it in the temporal throne of David. But Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Hallelujah. When David wrote Psalm 72 that we, I quoted from this morning, earlier on in the service, at the beginning, he had Solomon in mind, but there was a greater than Solomon here, and it was King David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because this psalm, Psalm 72, depicts a kingdom without borders. Hallelujah. A kingdom that has an eternal duration. And listen to what it says of it. Let me remind you what it says of it. His kingdom shall endure forever. His name shall endure, continue as long as the sun. All men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Friends, won't be long after we die if we die we don't we're not still alive when the rapture comes but if we die our names will be forgotten but you know friends his name endures forever you know friends just think about it over 2000 years since he came and yet his name is still being revered and proclaimed in the nations of the world today his name will endure forever, forever. Friends, he's going to continue as long as the sun because he's risen, glorified, and exalted. You know, the apostles had been forbidden by the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem to speak his name, but they filled all Jerusalem with his name and with his doctrine. What a name that we hallow this morning, the Prince of of peace. No wonder we're praying, thy kingdom come. Hallelujah. And what's more, prophetically as well, the government will be upon his shoulder. Thank God the kingdom of Christ is not restricted. There's no boundaries. When Christ comes again, he will come and bring peace. The lion shall lie with the lamb in his millennial reign as he brings peace. Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and peace, 
there will be no end. And thank God there's going to be a new heaven. There's going to be a new earth. And Christ shall reign. Hallelujah. You know, it's very striking that government and peace go together. Wherever you have no government, you'll have no peace. Many governments across the world today can only maintain a certain assemblance of peace in their land. Sometimes by strong arm tactics. I think we're getting a bit like that in our own nation. Sometimes by repression or loss of individual freedoms and aggression. But thank God, friends, that's not the kingdom of Christ. His government and his peace go together. Hallelujah. And those that are under his reign or under his government will experience his peace. And the kingdom of the king, prince of peace, grows and progresses through the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts and lives of people through the gospel of the Prince of Peace. What a message we have to proclaim. You know, in Mark 1, 14 and 15, he was telling them how to enter into this kingdom. And of course, you can only enter it through repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder, have we repented of our sin? Have we believed that Christ took our sin and sorrow and paid the price on our behalf? Because there's still room in the kingdom. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You know, when I read that line, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, I thought, you know, the church lacks zealous Christians today. It lacks commitment. It lacks conviction. It lacks holy enthusiasm and holy zeal. Oh, friends, I pray that God will pour some of his holy zeal on us today. Because, friends, it's the zeal of the Lord of hosts that will fulfill what he said in Isaiah. You know, the hymn writer wrote a hymn years ago, and a beautiful hymn, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth its successive journeys run, his kingdom stretch from shore to shore, till sun shall rise and set no more. Blessings abound where'er he reigns, the prisoner leaps to lose his chains, the weary find eternal rest, and all the sons of want are blessed. So, friends, wonderful, counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Friends, he's come before us today. Let us bow before him. Worship him. Because, friends, he's coming back, taking vengeance on those who know not the gospel and on those who have rebelled against him. But he's coming as the Prince of Peace on the eternal throne. Hallelujah. Father, bless your word to our hearts and glorify thy name. Amen. Well, I did say we'd finish by 12, and it's not 5 2 yet. So we can time to sing our last. For the last time, I know we've been doing it every Sunday morning during this series, but it encapsulates the text. So for the last time this year, for unto us a child is born. And let's stand and sing and glorify God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you excited in God? Yeah. Glory to God. I'm glad you're awake. Amen. And after that, I'll ask Robert uh, to close for us in prayer. Thank you.
you for your ministry to us this morning. Lord, we thank you for the Prince of Peace. Lord, we thank you for that peace that reigns in our hearts through knowing Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you we can say with the hymn writer, oh, the peace my Savior gives. Yes. Peace I never knew before. And my way has brighter grown since I learned to trust in thee. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love towards us. We thank you for your great grace. Lord, we pray you continue to bless us during these holidays, Lord. Bless our time with our families that precious time, Lord, away from the...